Hey, we're going to start in just a minute. We're going to wait for a, for a second here and see if there's a couple more people logging on. Just give us uh, about 30 seconds and uh, we'll begin. Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Antonio coming to you direct from McAllen, Texas. I'm here with Dr. John Young, who's going to be discussing scientific literacy and its relationship to democracy. Before we begin, I'd like to start by thanking our president, Dr. Morales and Dean Sullivan for their support of faculty efforts at student enrichment and community engagement, including programs like these. I'd also like to thank my colleagues, Misty Wilson-Mertens and Angela Thurman, who are diligently working behind the scenes. One quick announcement. If you're a student or a guest of a student who is attending this event for extra credit, I'll be posting a link in the video description to a survey at the end of the talk. In order to get extra credit, you must fill out this survey. So once again, if you're a student or a guest of a student who's attending for extra credit, be sure to fill out the survey, which you'll find in the video description that I'll put at the end of the talk. Finally, if you're interested in seeing more events like this, remember to click subscribe to the channel. We have lots of great programs coming up and we got a fantastic one for you here today. Dr. Young is joining us from Boston, where he is a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Medical School in the Department of Genetics. Currently, he's investigating the evolutionary and developmental mechanisms behind avian wing morphology and diversity. He holds a Master's of Science in Marine Ecology from the University of Oregon, Eugene, and a PhD in Molecular Biology from Molecular Cell Biology from the University of California, Berkeley. Among his many academic achievements, he has several important publications in top peer-reviewed journals, including Developmental Cell, Developmental Science, and Science, one of the most prestigious scholarly journals in all of scientific research. And he was the recipient of the Ruth L. Kirchstein National Research Service Award from 2015 to 2018. If you have any questions for Dr. Young, you can type them in in the comments at any time, and at the end, we'll get to as many as we can. Welcome to you, Dr. Young. All right, thank you, Tony. Um, yeah, so I appreciate the introduction. It's very kind, and I don't know how much I deserve all of those things. But um, that said, I'd like to give a little introduction to the practice of basic science and how we fit that into our, our um, current environment. And um, afterwards, like Tony said, or Dr. Squire said, I'd be happy to uh, take any, uh, any questions you may have. So give me, bear with me one second while I switch to the presentation. You'll be able to follow along on the slides while I talk about them, and then I'll take any questions. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yeah, we see it. Okay, great. Okay, so I'd like to start with a little bit of a historical lesson. And it has to do with the treatment for type 1 diabetes. Prior to the 1960s, diabetes treatment was extremely expensive, even more so than it is today, although today it's still an expensive therapy. But a beyond, but different from today, it was also very dangerous. So type one diabetes is, uh, occurs when you don't have enough insulin in your blood. And the way that this was treated was that insulin was harvested from fetal calves to be injected into humans to allow them to live just a few more years than they would have been expected to. Now, if you inject these proteins into into humans, if you inject cow proteins into humans, you can often have massive allergic reactions 
And Leonard Thompson, seen down here in the corner of the slide, was one of the first people to be injected with bovine insulin and suffered severe uh, allergic reactions to this. So let's fast forward to the 1960s. And let's say you have a few quarters or a few dollars to give to research. And you have your choice to fund two different projects. One project would be to focus on finding an affordable treatment for type 1 diabetes. Or would you fund a project that asks, how do bacteria protect themselves from viruses? So bacteria, just like we are, we, are, we do, um, we can contract viruses. And in bacteria, what happens is DNA from the virus is injected into the bacterial cell and inserts itself, that DNA, into the bacterial genome or into the, the DNA of the bacterium. And they have ways to protect against this. So, like I said, it's the 1960s. Which do you choose to fund? Personally, I may think that I might donate to uh, finding this affordable treatment for type 1 diabetes, considering what a devastating disease that was. But interestingly, in the 1960s, the National Institutes of Health, this is a government organization that is funded by tax, tax dollars, took tax money, which was given to this, this organization, the NIH, or the National Institutes of Health. And what the NIH does is it takes that tax money and then distributes it to practicing scientists to fund their research. So they give the money to the scientists, and what they decided to do does is it takes that tax money and then distributes And what they did is they decided to fund project number two, how do bacteria protect themselves from viruses? Now you may think like this is kind of a waste of money. Who cares? Why would should we even care about how bacteria protect themselves from viruses when people suffer from things like diabetes? But the thing is, the NIH was very far-sighted in understanding what projects are important and what should be funded. This is the promise of basic science because just be, because people who are just interested in understanding how bacteria work, how viruses work, became the following um, discoveries. And what they found was that bacteria produce these specific enzymes that can move pieces of DNA around. And they do that in the bacteria to remove pieces of viral DNA. But what the scientists found was that those same enzymes can be moved to move pieces of DNA from different organisms together. And eventually what happened was there was a discovery that could take the human insulin gene, the DNA for that, put that into the bacteria and allow them to make human insulin. Now we have a very less expensive mechanism to make human insulin, which when injected into humans does not cause that same kind of allergic response that we saw Leonard Thompson get. But the beauty of this is it didn't just end at human insulin. This is where we also discovered ways to produce cancer drugs on a really high um, production scale. And not only that, the ability to move pieces of DNA around from, from different organisms and, and sequencing technology allowed us to figure out the whole human genome sequence. So just stemming from this question, this early question of how do bacteria protect themselves from viruses led to this massive discovery and application for human health and diseases. This right here is the promise of basic research. So how do we do this? Well, the way you do this is we practice what's called the, uh, the steps of the scientific process. And the very first step in this is to make an observation. And I think a really beautiful way to explain this is to um, go back to Alexander Fleming, who found, who was a co-discoverer of penicillin, penicillin. And what he did is he went away on vacation. And when he came back to his lab, his lab was pretty messy. And he took out his cultures of Staphylococcus, which is a pathogenic bacteria, a bacteria that causes disease. 
And what he found was that wherever there was penicillin mold or bread mold, he found that the colonies close to it, to it were smaller or didn't grow as well. So based on that, that observation, he came up with an hypothesis. And his hypothesis was, hmm, perhaps something from that mold is preventing the growth of that bacteria. So he makes this observation. He thinks of a way that could explain what is going on. That's his hypothesis. And the next thing you do is you test that hypothesis. So in order to do that, what he did is he took mice and infected them with Staphylococcus or this pathogenic bacteria. This is the same kind of um, bacteria that can cause strep throat. Well, in mice, it can kill them. But what he did is he split his groups into as groups of mice into two. And he gave half of them this juice from the penicillin mold and found that those mice injected with both the Staphylococcus bacteria along with the penicillium juice lived, whereas the ones that just received the bacteria died. So then what you do is you either you accept your hypothesis or revise it based on the results from your experiment. In this case, he was on the right track that perhaps that something from that mold was preventing growth of bacteria, but he revised it to think that perhaps this penicillium, whatever this bacteria, this mold is secreting is actually killing the bacteria. And this was at the nascent discovery of antibiotics and the discovery of penicillin, which we still use today. And then finally, what you're going to do once you finish all of this is you repeat it, make sure it's real, and then you publish it in a peer reviewed journal where other scientists look at your results and see if you've, you've done your experiments in a logical way and that your conclusion is correct. So I, as, as Dr. Squire said, I am an evolutionary biologist. And what I do is I study various embryos to determine how evolution has shaped all of the animals we see today. So basically what I am is just curious about animal diversity and how do we generate that diversity. And the way I do that is I study their embryos because all animals start from a single cell with a single genome. And somehow the, that cell divides, those cells move around, they turn into different shapes and different tissues and produce birds or frogs, or in this case, snails, that all have different morphologies or different shapes. But we don't understand what is the genetic control over that. I am a basic scientist. I ask questions that are just academic. We want to understand how this works. So these are the ways we're going to approach this question and try to understand what are some of the genetic modifications between chickens and emus that result in either wings that are capable of flying, because believe it or not, chickens do fly, or in emus where they can no longer fly. Now, I said that I'm a basic scientist, and I am. But our work has broader applications. So what you're seeing here is a time-lapse video of a developing frog embryo. And underneath that are a number of genes that are found in flies, or Drosophila, which is a fruit fly, a very common fly that you, you'd, you'd find if you leave your uh, oranges out for too long. And what I want you to appreciate from this frog video is to see how those tissues are moving around. And you can see streams of, of cells moving around where the head forms. And the reason why I say that our work has broader implications, because what is happening in this frog as it develops is those cells divide. They divide very quickly. They move around. And once they move, they often turn into different types of tissue, be it bone or muscle. And that is exactly what happens in cancer. Cancers often start out with unchecked proliferation or cell division. Some of those cells detach and move around to other places in the body, and then they turn into things that they're not supposed to do, supposed to turn into. So like maybe perhaps some of those cells will start in the skeletal system, move through the bloodstream into the lung and turn into bone. That's what a metastasis is. So it's not surprising that a lot of the genes that I discover 
are that people in our lab studying frogs and fruit flies discover are the same genes that are misregulated or go awry in cancer. So this is like, this really illustrates, I think, the, the promise of basic science, where we don't necessarily know what we're gonna find. We just wanna understand how it works. And oftentimes what we do, when understanding how things work, many more applications come out from that. But as beautiful as a system this is, and as pure as it sounds, science doesn't always happen in a vacuum. There are a lot of other things that are going on in the world at the time when these laboratory experiments are being done and reported on. And one a nice illustration of this, well, I don't know if it's necessarily nice, but was in the Renaissance when Galileo was, purport, was reporting Copernicus theory of a heliocentric galaxy where the earth actually uh, revolved around the sun. At the time, everything was believed to be geocentric where every, all the other planets in the sun revolved, revolved around the earth. And this is well accepted by the Catholic church at the time. So much so that when Galileo purported the heliocentric theory, he was imprisoned by the church due to his heretical beliefs and was forced to recant his findings in saying that the earth went around the sun. Now we all know today that heliocentric theory is correct, the earth goes around the sun. But at the time it, when these discoveries were being made, it didn't fit with the popular culture or the popular politics at the time. And because of that, there was some fallout against Galileo. Now this is not just restricted to times in the Renaissance. Um, another well-known scientist, Charles Darwin, who uh, went on a uh, long circumglobal boat trip uh, when he went on the HMS Beagle, looking at different animals that he found from all over the world and came up with this theory of natural selection. And this theory was met with quite a bit of um, resistance and challenged most often on a religious basis. And it still is today. We still hear about um, efforts to push back on the teaching of, of evolution in, in schools. So if this is the case, and I talked about the way that the scientific process occurs, what happens when science and politics are in conflict? And as they are with a lot of hot button issues today, things like climate change, I mentioned evolution, things in like drug testing and food and safety nutrition, especially when there's a lot of monetary interest in the outcomes of the way science is, is um, conducted. So I talked earlier about the scientific process. If we can go back there, we can start to understand how potentially could this method be corrupted. So let's go back to this discovery of penicillin and how it was found that penicillin makes this, anti, this antibiotic compound and was proven that way with this experiment in the mice. But let's say, let's do a thought experiment, that we perform, we work through the scientific method all the way up to the point where we test the mice, we infect them with staphylococcus, and then take a subset of them and inject them with this potential antibiotic. But instead of counting all of them, what if 95 out of 100 of those, those injected mice that had staphylococcus as well as the penicillin died but only five of them lived. But instead of reporting that, we just focused on those five that lived to support our hypothesis. Would, be right, would we be right in doing that? If 95 out of 100 of them died, even if they got the penicillin juice, how might that change our, our conclusion? So if there was a, a vested interest in the outcome of the experiment, this method is potentially could be corrupted, correct? And the consequences from this can range from, from the absurd to, to the dangerous. So some of you may have heard about the Flat Earth Society or people who decided that they believe that the Earth is flat. We all know that the Earth is round, 
but in order to prove the earth is flat they're going on these different types of experiments trying to prove that the earth is flat now the effort here is not in discovery the effort there is trying to prove themselves correct which is not which is antithetical to the way we do science in science what we're trying to do is try to understand the way things work the natural order and doing experiments to test that and looking at all of the data. Now I said that this can range from the absurd to the dangerous because vaccines also do not cause autism, but there is a very vocal group that suggests that they do based on very bad science that has already been recanted. But because of that, measles is now on the rise in the United States because of people that believe that these vaccines cause autism. They don't. Um, the science is, is solid on this, but um, due to this, this belief, um, we can actually have massive consequences to, the, to global health and, and human, um, human diseases. So with that said, how do you trust the science that you hear about? I, I, hear that most people hear science news through Facebook. Now, Facebook is not necessarily a, a place where that delivers science news. It's a platform where science get, may be posted. So the thing you have to do is consider the source. Find out where that, that piece of reporting or that scientific fact is coming from. And one of the things I like to say is that if you're doing this, be familiar with different outlets. So up in the corner here, the upper left hand corner are these two journals called Nature and Science. These are peer reviewed journals where scientists submit their, their experiments and their results to be reviewed by other scientists and evaluated before they're allowed to be published and purported. Um, if you get your news, science news from places like CNN, Fox News, these are not reliable sources. They're, they're often very um, sensationalized with very little scientific fact. And certainly places like Natural News, Infowars, this is just, this is not a place you wanna go to base any kind of scientific fact on. And the reason why I say this is because you need to ask yourself that there's an obvious ideological monetary bias that benefits from the conclusion. Oftentimes, that can be a, uh, a suggestion. Uh, for example, in the 60s, a lot of tobacco companies were funding research or funding findings that suggested that cigarettes do not cause cancer. Um, there was a, certainly a vested interest in the cigarette and the tobacco industry in, in that finding. And the reason why those, um, excuse me, that, the reason why those journals that are found in this upper left-hand corner, Nature and Science, are very um, reliable sources is because the science that is pr presented and reported on in there are th things that come from multiple scientists doing these same types of experiments and independently coming to the same type of conclusion because they're getting the same types of results. So I'd like to return now to the promise of basic research and returning to that initial question that I asked you that if it was the 1960s which project did you would you want to uh, fund uh, affordable treatment for insulin or discovering how bacteria protect themselves and indeed this question is still outstanding we still ask this question how do bacteria protect themselves from viruses now some of you may have heard of CRISPR or CRISPR-Cas9, or genome editing. This is a method where that if we can experimentally use this, these um, reagents or the, these molecular tools to go in and change pieces of the DNA. It, per, it makes from a, um, a very important and powerful potential therapeutic for things like sickle cell disease or Huntington's disease, places where we know what the genetic lesion is that causes these different diseases. Now, CRISPR-Cas9 was discovered as a method for 
bacteria to protect themselves from viruses. It's another method of moving pieces of DNA around. Now couple that with stem cell technology and we can hear about reports of designer babies. We can also hear about reports of, um, of treatment for HIV. So indeed, politics and policy, I believe, has a very important role in determining what to do with the scientific discoveries. But it shouldn't play a strong a role in determining what that discovery is. Um, we are grateful uh, as practicing scientists for the NIH for funding our research. And we're glad that people can take what we find and apply it to more human um, health type of applications. But we're equally grateful that the government doesn't tell us what it is we discovered. So I just want to close with this amazing note to kind of like illustrate the history of science and how there's this undercurrent of science that often occurs even in times of massive global conflict. And what you're looking at here is the text from a sign that was left on a Japanese marine lab at the end of World War II. It reads, this is a marine biological station with a history of over 60 years. If you're from the Eastern coast, some of you might know Woods Hole or Mount Desert Island. If you're from the West coast, you might know Pacific Grove or Puget Sound Biological Station. This is a place like one of those. Take care of this place and protect the possibility for the continuation of our peaceful research. You can destroy weapons and war instruments, but please save civil equipments for Japanese students when you're through. With your job here, notify the university and let us come back to our scientific home. And it was signed the last one to go. This was signed by a Japanese marine biologist and found by a, a soldier from Massachusetts who knew Woods Hole, which is a marine lab that is here on Cape Cod. He brought this, this sign back to Woods Hole and the scientist that wrote this ended up becoming a faculty member at the Marine Biological Station at Woods Hole. And I think it's a really beautiful illustration of the way that science happens and the practice of science occurs even between massively warring nations, but there's still this peaceful undercurrent that, that occurs. And with that, I would love to take any questions or any thoughts you may have and um, hear from you as well. So let me switch that back. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Young. Thank I'm going to take a minute. Let's see if, uh, let's give a couple of minutes, uh, let our viewers write some questions in, in, the, uh, in the chat there. And while those are coming in, I'm, I'm going to take a, an opportunity to, to ask you a few questions. Sure. So you had mentioned a couple of things that I wanted to circle back with. Uh, you talked about the Flat Earth Society. There's a new documentary, relatively new documentary on Netflix called Behind the Curve. And in this documentary, they essentially try to reveal to the viewers what the mindset of these Flat Earth Society people are. Okay. okay? And it is a phenomenon which uh, is known as confirmation bias, where it's essentially that you ignore all the evidence that goes against what you believe and only right. accept information that you believe, right? Yeah. And so you mentioned how they're setting up experiments and, and these kinds of things, right? Right. And the problem with the way that they're setting up experiments is, as you pointed out, Mm -hmm. They're looking for information that confirms what they already believe. Right. 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 And the point in science is belief is always up for debate. It's always temporary. It's never finalized. And actually, when you test a hypothesis, what you're saying is, I think that this is right. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say to myself, 
if this is correct, under what circumstances is this going to be correct? If I do A, then I expect B to happen, right? And if B doesn't happen, based on my expectation, I got to reevaluate what I believe, right? Yeah. So, um, let, tell me if, I, if I'm going in the wrong direction on this. But the, one of the things that we do as scientists when we form a hypothesis is not only do we do an experiment to see if we're right, we often do experiments to test if we're wrong. So, also for, what, this is called falsification. This is what we do. If, if indeed this is the case, you form a hypothesis, and then based on that, you make predictions. If I'm correct, this will happen. Right, and if that does not happen, you can you can uh, reevaluate your hypothesis. The other, the flip side of those experiments is you say like, "This is my hypothesis," and if I do this experiment, and I get I get this result, that that is in conflict with the way I think is it is going on, and therefore my hypothesis must be wrong, and I'll go on to something else. You re um, reform a different hypothesis, and exactly. potentially even have to go back. Right. To the whole theory. So right? I'll, I will give you an example, a, a really uh, small example from my own work. I had a hypothesis that in the emu, they misexpressed this gene. And that, that misexpression of the gene forced this tissue to become heart like as opposed to wing like. Now, for that to happen, these two genes had to be in the same cells if my hypothesis was correct. And I had to do a number of experiments to determine that. And what I found was that indeed, these two genes were not in the same cells. They were in different cells. Based on that, I had to reject my whole hypothesis that the reason why the emu had the small wing is because it was turning it into heart tissue. That's not the case. My experiments showed me that that's not the case. I have to come up with another explanation for what we observe. That was a way that I did to test, to ask if I'm right. Now. Let's say, let's say I wanted to know if I, if I do a dance, the sun will come up in the morning. Chances are the sun are, is going to come up in the morning, whether I do the dance or not. But what I can do is choose to believe that I did the dance, sun came up. Therefore, me doing the dance makes the sun come up, right? What I'm doing there is just I know I'm ensuring the result and implying what I want to be the cause of it to that result, thereby ensuring that I'm collecting only evidence that will support what I already believe, which we can't do in science, not if you're doing it correctly. Okay. The, uh, the other thing I want to uh, circle back to, um, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to bring together two things that you mentioned. First of all, you mentioned Galileo, mm -hmm. and then also you, you mentioned climate change. Yeah. Okay. Now, climate change is a big political issue these days, right? Mm -hmm. And when you get into the realm of politics, that's a different realm than the realm of science, right? Politics yeah. is about groups of people with different economic interests fighting for what's best for themselves. Absolutely. Yep. And in science, like you said, you, you had a theory about, you know, emus wings or something like this, and you had some investment in that time and energy, but the, the results just didn't bear out. So you had to like th throw that theory away, come up with a better one that would explain what you're seeing. Right now, a lot of times what we're doing now is in, we're seeing, for example, on, on news shows and, uh, you know, politicians and this kind of stuff wanting to discredit the science. Now, the reason right. that they want to discredit that science is because either the politician or, or the, the people that back that politician or, or whatever groups, you know, interest groups or whatever have financial reasons to do that. Right. So if you're a company that, let's say, produces, um, electricity using uh, using coal or fossil fuels or something like this that's contributing to climate change. You don't want it to be true and you don't want people to believe it because it 
jeopardizes your ability to the make financial money. Interest. Right, sure. It, exactly. Now, the way that the, the talking point that people are saying now to, you know, come back at the scientists is to reverse that argument. Like, you know, so scientists are saying they're just saying this because they have financial reason to say that. Correct. And now the, the oil companies are trying to put that back on the scientists and say, no, no, the scientists, they're the ones that have the financial interest in, in doing this. Right? right. And this is what brings me to Galileo. OK, so Galileo was basically using a paradigm that went against the old paradigm. The old paradigm wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And so he said, look, this doesn't make sense. I'm doing these calculations. I'm looking at this and this and there's retrogrades and there's all this weird stuff that this theory that the Earth's in the center of everything. It doesn't make sense with the data that I'm, I'm observing. Right? Right, right. And all he's doing is looking at the science, looking at the data, looking at observation, using his eyes and that. And he's looking at Jupiter and he's seeing like, you know, dots going around it and all this other kind of stuff. But they're going to kill him. The, the, the church is going to threatens to kill him because all the bishops and, you know, the pope and all, like their whole standing and the political organization that they built is predicated on people believing that they understand what's going on and all this. Right. Right. But he went through anyway, like he ended up recanting and going through with the science. And because he, he was the one that broke that paradigm, he's going to be forever known as like one of the greatest scientists, like Einstein and all these, you know, uh, Newton, these mm. guys all broke out of the paradigm. So if you're a scientist and correct me if I'm wrong, the paradigm right now is that we're we're believing with good cause that human activity is causing global warming and climate change, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. But if you figured out that everyone else was wrong, you'd be the most famous scientist in the whole world if you could back it up with data and facts. Am I wrong? Would you be the most famous scientist in the world? Um Perhaps, however, there are, there's a, let's, so if we come to evolution, there's this whole idea of Lamarckian evolution. That's this idea that if you stretch your neck, maybe in your offspring, you have a longer neck. And that's how giraffes eventually evolved longer necks. This is acquired characteristics. Um, this went against the, the idea at the time, or this was an alternative explanation for natural selection. Lamarck is still talked about today. He actually had some major contributions. He's quite a famous scientist, but he's, he's quite famous for being wrong. Um, I don't know if saying that climate change is not a cause by humans no, but what I, let me, let me I, I don't, let me I don't know if it'd be on the scale. So you have, you have the Ptolemaic model which is like the earth is, was in the middle. And then you got the yeah. Copernican model, right? Right. So Copernicus, versus geocentric. Yeah. So, so Copernicus is, he's the one like that broke the old mold. Yeah. You know what I mean? And sure. he was better able to explain it or you have like, you know, uh, Newton okay. comes Here. along and then Einstein breaks yeah. the Newtonian mold. Right. Yeah. So if you have, if you're the scientist that breaks the mold because there's something wrong with the current science, you're the big guy, right? You're yeah. the famous. I think, I think you're make, there's, there's one issue here. I mean, I may be Pollyannic in this idea, but the thing is Galileo came up with that based on the calculations, right? He didn't come up with this idea because he wanted to turn over the apple cart. The results were sec were suggesting that was the case. Of course, before, right? So the observation, before, the observation informs yeah. the theory. Before, if you have a theory and then, but your the observations right. don't correspond with the theory, right. then you have to revise the theory. Exactly. So let's say, let's go back to your global climate change, global warming um, example. If your, if your motivation is to someday become the most famous scientist in the world and thereby challenge this, this, broadly accepted theory, then you're probably in danger of that same confirmation bias that you were talking about earlier because you have this inherent 
or this subconscious desire to to be a disruptor to to like go against the grain of, of this and it's not necessarily it's okay it's okay to not um accept everything that you you read at first but follow the science if you if you do the experiment if you do collect the data and you do the calculations and it points in a different way by all means report that see if other people get the same thing but if you're doing that with the express purpose of trying to say i'm going to turn this over so that i can be the most famous or that i will be remembered in history that motivation can be dangerous because you may be trying to fit data into an explanation that you would have more benefit from. And this is where peer review comes in, right? So there's other scientists that are looking at it and say, hey, listen, you know, how you did that experiment doesn't make sense. It's not logical or what, you know, you're missing something, right? Right. I got a question from a, from a viewer, OP. It says, mm -hmm. in an educated, is an educated electorate necessary for a healthy and functioning democracy? If so, how can uh, a being a literate, how can being a literate consumer of scientific information make you a more informed member of the electorate? Yeah. Um, so I think, I think uh, scientific literacy is going to be very important for uh, a functioning, a well-functioning electorate. That doesn't mean you need to have a scientific degree. That doesn't mean you have to have a, a college degree. I think that you just need to be aware of the way that some things can be manipulated. And um, really the thing I, I often think about is is there really an extremely obvious benefit to this to this finding of this this report? For example, like you read those things like eating eating chocolate every day will expand or extend your lifetime. Like doubtful. Um, you got to look for things that that probably seem a little too good to be true, um, and really go to the source. You don't necessarily need to understand how the experiments were done or or um, or or who did the the experiments, but you, it's good to develop some idea of what things you should be skeptical skeptical about and what things you shouldn't. And um, really, you don't you you definitely don't need degrees in science to do that. I think a little bit of common sense can go a long way in these type of things, um, and sometimes just be careful. Okay, we got another question here from a, a viewer. Alandra Ramirez asked, do you think their theories were different because of the time period they were in and, uh, and the less, I guess, lesser, lesser knowledge and technology at the time? So I guess she's, this is a uh, reference to probably some of these uh, previous scientists that we were mentioning. Sure, sure, absolutely. I, I, there was definitely there's a um, you know a a limitation of the technologies at the, at times. So there was a while when we thought there were only four elements: earth, water, um, fire, and I don't remember. I want to say earth, wind, and fire, but <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, you know, we we and we just we didn't have the sensitivity and ability to make sense of the natural world that we do today. So we tried our best as as, as people. So indeed, there's definitely a limitation to, to discovery scientific um, practice based on available technology. That said, there is also a huge amount of pushback based on outside influences. And the example I'll give you there was that Aristotle was one of the, I, was the first developmental biologist in the sense that he looked at embryos. And what he did is each day he looked at chicken embryos. He'd open a chicken embryo, or a chicken egg and we'd look at it then he'd, he'd take one that was incubated for a couple of days and he'd look at that one and based on that he saw it go from just like this white mass of nothingness into this embryo that had uh, a head into this chicken and what he he came up with this idea of of increasing complexity in the embryo he was actually right that's what happens but his 
his theories were thrown out hundreds of years later because of religious influence in which everything had to be performed. Everything was in the, um, in, in its current state. And people believe because of that, people believe that when they looked at sperm cells and really, um, crude microscopes, they could see little humans inside the sperm cells called humunculi. And that wasn't overturned until the 1800s. So indeed, there is definitely limits that you have at technology. That, that happens today. There are questions we want to answer. We can't because we don't have the technology. But there is also outside influences. Uh, Dr. Young, you mentioned earlier about the funding that uh, researchers like yourself and your colleagues get that comes from, uh, usually a lot of it comes from the federal government, but sometimes right. state governments uh, have mm -hmm. small, smaller sums of money as well. Maybe you could reiterate, you know, for us, why you think it's important that, you know, we spend our tax money for scientists to, to uh, do experiments and, and these kinds of things? Yeah, uh, this is a great question. Because um, right now, science funding has kind of plateaued. And with purchasing power, it's actually going down. Funding of basic science is incredibly important because not just for this idea that we don't know what we're necessarily going to find. Understanding how things work allow us to then use those, those methods for applications that go far beyond um, just what we're doing when we want to say, like, I want to understand how does the frog make his spinal cord. It's questions like that that have led to those same kind of discoveries that have developed cancer therapeutics, that have developed things like atomic energy. Um, just basic understanding really allows us to develop technologies that are gonna go far beyond just science. They're gonna be important for transportation, for um, civil society, in the sense that a well, a comp or places that invest very heavily in science tend to be more competitive. So if we decide that we're going to limit the type of science we do, if we're gonna cut back on scientific funding, we could end up losing a competitive edge in technological um, development in, and of course medical development in, in the global community. Uh, and really, we hear, these, we hear these stories about ridiculous studies. I remember during the 2008 election, somebody was, was um, um, decreeing that we spent all this money on fruit fly um, experiments. The thing is, in the fruit fly, we learned about receptors and molecular biology that fed directly into things that we now know about, thing, uh, about the gene BRCA, which is involved in breast cancer, and the receptor that is um, targeted by HER2 nu, which is another um, breast cancer therapeutic. Um, basic science has, has provided the foundation for just about everything that we, we have um, developed technologically and medically in the last hundred years. So certainly it's an investment in our future. And um, in the short term, it really uh, allows us to, to make some important er, discoveries. Okay, let's, uh, let's take one more question. We had a question here, I can't find it right now. It was essentially about ethical issues. Yeah. And this, the, the ethical issues of science is another area where a democratic government and science would actually uh, meet, right? Because we're looking at uh, regulation and these kinds of things. So why don't you tell us uh, briefly what you can uh, about, you know, what the ethical limits of scientific research are and, you know, sort of if you have any stories or thoughts about how the, the government regulation and, and, uh, and scientific ethics, let's say, meet. Yeah. Um, again, this is very, this is very important. As I am, I'm, I'm certainly a proponent of basic science and funding basic science. That said, 
there's a huge role for ethical considerations in that funding. So um, I can tell you personally, tied to all federal funding, we have to take courses on ethical conduct of research that covers everything from treatment of our laboratory or organisms to how do we um, behave around other scientists, what is, what is ethical in um, collecting data and reporting data in how we collaborate with other scientists. Um, and, the, and the reason for this is, is important, is like the peer, for just pure driven curiosity should not be the only basis for what kind of science gets done. We have to take an ethical approach to this. Um, and one example that, that could come up is at the end of this little um, presentation I did, as I mentioned CRISPR. CRISPR holds a lot of potential for being able to treat human diseases, but it has, it's fraught with ethical concerns as well, because it is possible to change the genetic makeup of, of um, your children if you wanted to do that, to the point where there was a, um, a paper or some results that were, were reported, it wasn't published, of a researcher in China that genetically modified some human human embryos and they were carried to term with the effort of trying to make it so that they would be unable to contract HIV. Uh, I think I think the government and the scientific com com global scientific community has been correct in s speaking out against that those kind of practices and saying that we need to make a call for uh, an ethical guideline and standard for how we're going to apply these type of types of um, findings and these types of technology because just the pure, just out of, like full curiosity, you need to have some ethical boundaries on that. But it, but certainly the government and the democratic society at large should have a a, a major role in determining how these different applications are applied. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Young. That was a great talk. Uh, just a reminder, if you're attending this event for extra credit, when I'm done here, I'm gonna post a link to a survey in the description of the video. So make sure that you fill out that, that survey to get your extra credit. So that's it for, for us today. Thanks everyone for, for coming and, and thank you again, Dr. Young. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it.